Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, great to see everybody. And thank you um, again for inviting me today. OK, great. OK, so I'm going to be talking today about placekeeping, this concept that um, we've been uh, sort of hearing a little bit about. And I'm so thrilled that it's, um, it's actually written in on, on the programme. So thanks very much for that. Um, basically, um, what we do uh, in the placekeeping group that I'm a part of, we look at the importance of a long-term approach when we're thinking about management. So I teach a lot on landscape management in the department. And for most of you, a lot of this may not be new, but um, with the focus on partnerships um, that we're all grappling with, um, I'm hoping that there'll be some interesting things uh, that I'll share with you. And partnerships is something that we keep coming back to in our um, work, and it's because we keep coming, well, we, we keep thinking about who is doing these things. Who is it who cares? Um, who is it who uses our spaces? Who pays for them? Who owns them? Who manages them? Who's responsible? And who knows about them as well? And they can often be really different sets of stakeholders or potential users or non-stakeholders. Um, and these questions really drive us in our work um, that we take to management. And so thinking about the long term is one of the ways in which we can try and do this and put pressure or influence decision makers to be thinking long term. Uh, as Claire's just been outlining that, you know, some of this is really, really uh, getting, uh, getting through. But it's not easy to do. And um, you may well have your own examples. I really um, would be uh, very interested to hear about yours uh, for those of you who might be joining me in the partnership session uh, later on today. But to talk about place making, no, to talk about place keeping, you have to talk about place making. Um, and this is about making those places that people want to visit, uh, that we want to create and enhance, um, that we want to regenerate, that we've got funding to do that. But they're places that people want to come back to. They're welcoming, they're inclusive, they're good for our health because people feel attached to them and get that benefit from them. Um, but unfortunately, all the focus, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of focus on that sort of making side of things, means that we don't think enough about what happens when the place has been created. What comes next? So we talk about placekeeping as this idea of responsive management, which is an ongoing process, um, because a place is never effectively finished. And there are a lot of assumptions that go with this, that people will respect places. If we, if we put money into them, if we raise funds for them, they will respect them, they will use them um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a respectful way, um, that these spaces will just be looked after, it. this will happen. But of course, places can't look after themselves. They need ongoing care and attention. They usually require a particular set of skills, which will be specific to that local context, and they may change over time. And because once the contractors have finished, once the politicians have cut the ribbon, uh, once the capital investment has been spent, um, that's when the place gets used. That's when we get to really understand whether it's successful and when it, when it gets tested in practice. And so we've kind of developed this idea, sorry, I have to come up with a diagram, but for a place um, to be somewhere that people want to return to and spend time in requires thinking about partnership, Partners who will then work together to get funding, um, by which of course I, I mean revenue rather than just capital funding. Design which takes management into account, which is not always done. A decision making process in which ideally partners buy into this because there's a shared vision, which has got political support, which can often get hold of, um, uh, which uh, often help the, the, the get hold of the funding. And then evaluation to make sure that these places are working, that the functions and purposes in that local context, in that local neighbourhood, um, that they're all, they're all happening. So that's why we do a lot of work around post-occupancy evaluation. So once a place has been completed or constructed or regenerated, or um, as Claire was saying, you know, the work uh, around BNG, um, then we can go back and evaluate it. And this can be really useful, but it often, to be really useful, it has to be quite long-term work. So as I've highlighted um, with those who questions, partnership is the theme that we keep coming back to. And I'm going to um, share two examples um, at sort of different ends of the spectrum. I always think it's good to think about best practice and then where it hasn't worked so well. Um, and these are examples from Sheffield. Um, I'm kind of shameless into focusing on Sheffield, it, you know, it's, it feels sustainable, it feels like local, um, but also it's understanding that local context and I'm still learning so much about the city and how it works, but onto that in a moment. 
So there are going to be some quotes like this one um, throughout the slides. Um, these are from a piece of work that we did um, when we were examining a funded project which was, which was regenerating some green spaces in Sheffield, which was based all around communities being involved in that process. And these were funded about 10 years ago. Um, and that this is, this is why we have to take a long-term approach, because that allows time for people whose jobs might have depended on that project, on the success of that project, to have some distance from it, to be able to al allow them to answer questions that we had honestly, and without any fear of maybe losing their job if, um, if, if they were critical about the project and how it was going. So this is a project that was happening in the early 2000s, and I do think that some of these quotes will probably chime with your experiences. So this first quote is, there were loads of people who have been really energetic in getting involved in the design and, man and transformation of their parks, but we knew that the ongoing management was going to be trickier. Well, it always is, isn't it? And um, I don't need to remind you why it's important for us to think about this and, and place keeping, why it's important to make sure that we're thinking long term um, we will all have examples of places that have been abandoned or left behind or neglected or where the investment hasn't been safeguarded for whatever reason. And we're not in the business of blaming and shaming, but it's more about understanding that if we think about place keeping from the outset, then, then hopefully we will secure all of those benefits that we were trying to achieve in the first place. And what we've often found is that it's not necessarily about the physical infrastructure. Um, from the beginning, it's often very much about who's involved, those motivations and those drivers. Um, and, you know, is there, a, is there a goal that's shared? Are there aspirations that are shared? So I want to first start with an example that you may already have heard of. Um, and it starts in the Manor Castle Ward of uh, Sheffield, in the east of Sheffield which has been one of the UK's most deprived areas due to the long-term devastating economic decline of the steel industry um, in the 1980s. It suffered, this, is, this estate suffered from significant, horrendous antisocial behaviour, um, particularly in its green spaces. There were burnt out cars, joyriding, fly tipping, and more generally, no community involvement to speak of, certainly not that was constructive. And so I want to just uh, mention, well, talk a bit about Green Estate. So Green Estate was a social enterprise which was set up with a very small, relatively small amount of money uh, back in the 1990s. That was money from the from national government and the, the Manor and Castle Development Trust. And they worked together, taking an approach which was small scale and incremental. Fully aware of the difficult context um, in which they were working, Green Estate and the Development Trust knew not to invest time and resources in short-term capital investments without getting the community on board. So to address the lack of community involvement, Green Estate took this long-term placekeeping approach, which is based on stewardship. And it does differ from perhaps a more traditional council-led approach, which might, might be kind of about the capital investment and trying to make a, sort of an immediate change, although correct me if, uh, um, where you, you might be doing that differently but when green estate gains control over a site it immediately sets about making changes to that land very small scale visible actions such as securing the site so large boulders um, larger than these ones here actually this was a few years later um, boulders to stop the joyriders in cars and introducing um, low maintenance planting to show the community that something was happening it wasn't massive but something was happening Consultation came afterwards um, and their approach um, was for residents to judge what had been done rather than taking a blank canvas approach um, and then informal engagement with community members um, involved things like guided walks, taking time in the space to pinpoint issues and finding out what residents would like to see happen but responding to, to um, some low intervention, uh, low level interventions that were, were kind of um, were, were created. And Green Estate have been able to become financially sustainable by developing the Pictorial Meadows kind of a product, which was originally developed by one of my colleagues actually at the university, Professor Nigel Dunnett. And these are the meadow plantings, which you can see in many um, cities that were um, at the 2012 um, Olympic Games, um, not just in the UK, but increasingly around Europe as well. And for the most part, the planting goes down well. Um, while not immediately appreciated by all the manor residents, some of whom did say, what are you doing? We need houses, we don't need flowers. Um, but the improvement um, to the landscape, the colour, the presence of flowers for most of the year, this kind of sort of, you know, uh, care that was um, that's being demonstrated, again, even at a very small scale, it did go down um, well with the, with the residents. And this small scale approach with high impact has been tried 
and, and tested and Green Estate are able to use the land that they manage on behalf of the council to trial plant experiments as part of this big idea of enhanced nature which is what they're becoming increasingly well known for. Not everything works, they did um, fail at local cheese which um, we can talk about later but um, when they're doing their, um, you know, when they're making the changes to the landscape, um, they mix it up, they change it, they mow it, they um, adapt their flower mixes, um, and they're doing it in different ways in different places. But this is the same place at four different times uh, um, over over a period of, uh, I don't know, about thirteen or fourteen years. Um, again, residents can judge what's being done; they can respond to it, um, and it's not it's not there forever. But the small scale incremental approach has had resonance and has had positive economic effects for the wider neighbourhood. And actually people on the manor um, have a different expectation of nature now because of what they've been introduced to, um, rather than in other parts of the city where people are expecting a more formal kind of nature uh, or, you know, that they might see in their park. So that's been quite an interesting thing as well. Um, and that housing that people were asking for, um, well, it is, um, it is here and it is more of its coming. Um, and this is no mean feat, really, in a place where houses were being demolished because of that, you know, really quite horrendous antisocial behaviour, as I've mentioned. So for me, this was an example that has high capacity, and we'll, we continue to look at green estate. Um, it doesn't have high levels of resources or funding, but that capacity is high. Uh, green estate take on skills with horticultural, uh, sorry, take on staff with horticultural skills. It's not just about grounds maintenance. The staff have a say in how the enterprise is run and the philosophy around stewardship in place is, is implicit in what they do and the name itself kind of really captures it, Green Estate. But of course not all partnerships work well and they certainly don't work well all of the time and I'm not for a moment saying that Green, uh, green Estates has all been uh, plain sailing. Um, there are examples of, uh, of kind of poorer practice and coming from Sheffield, I feel it's incumbent on me to mention street trees. So I'm going for it, people. Come with me on this journey. It's been a journey, blimey. OK, so um, I know it's a parks forum, um, but I do think there are lessons that can be learned um, from, um, uh, from the partnerships that here has happened in a very different, uh, well, in a different setting, but certainly around the city's green infrastructure. So analysis that I've been doing uh, recently, I've been a little bit obsessed by it, I have to say, um, shows how this was an example of a, a partnership of, of, of sorts that's happening in cities across the country when it comes to street trees, but at a much, much larger scale. So um, it involved a private finance initiative, sorry, it involves, it's still ongoing, involves a private finance initiative project the local council working with the active help and financial support from national government to contract out its work to this private um, contractor, Amy, which um, is costing over £2 billion and counting. Um, and, um, you know, the, it's not unusual uh, in practice for a contractor to be involved, as you'll all know, um, in delivering the business of a, of a council. So in this example, it was managing the, it is managing the, the ongoing street scene, road resurfacing, pavement improvement, new street lights throughout the whole city and cutting down half of the city street trees. This was written into the contract. This was, this was a professional journal where, uh, back in 2012 um, and this is probably I think the only kind of formal uh, um, and publicly available at the time uh, reference to this. But there it is, ha replacing half of the city's 36,000 highway trees. Um, so, so far so normal, I would say. There was a contract, it was confidential, um, and it was responding to the city's um, pothole reputation, um, which was uh, becoming, becoming an issue. And it was seen that um, uh, the way to deal with this was this large-scale PFI uh, initiative. In, in fact, it was, it was almost the, uh, the only um, thing on the table, depending on who you talk to or who you, you, you hear talking about this. Um, it started to become a problem when residents began to oppose and question the approach that was taken to highways and every other street in the city. Um, so the same approach was taken to highways as to leafy residential streets. And why did it happen? Well, part of it was because the partnership arrangement between the council and Amy included claims that there would be a process of meaningful community consultation. But that just did not happen. Um, um, and you know, as things are coming to light um, and we're, we're analysing what, what happened, this is because in the contract it stated that half the trees were going to be cut down, as we say. It, it didn't, it kept being refuted, but when the contract was, um, was finally uh, made uh, publicly available, it was there in black and white. 
And so not cutting down those trees will be breaking the contract, or so it was argued at the time. And this goes back to these issues of different agendas that could not be reconciled. It was also um, uh, not helped by very poor communication. And those of you who might have followed the situation in Sheffield would know it became incredibly toxic and very difficult um, in the city. So the council um, uh, received a petition which was um, received by 10,000, uh, sorry, that was signed by 10,000 uh, citizens, although that was kind of refuted. It was presented to the full council and therefore the council agreed to ask an independent tree panel to assess a number of trees after a number of high profile incidents um, involving lots of protesters. And they promised to consider the panel's advice before making a final decision on tree felling. In reality, the council rejected over 90% of the panel's recommendations um, and they did not provide any of that transparency. So again, communication was just really poor. So here's an example. This is Brighton Terrace Street, which is near me. Um, and the council is clearly not following the advice which um, the panel have, have highlighted in red. We find the tree to be healthy and not in need of replacement. Um, the summary as made by the council was that the panel says remove and replace the tree. Well, it clearly doesn't say that. Uh, therefore, um, the final decision is just cut down the tree and replace it. Um, but again, we've got this problem that the contract said, and it wasn't, it wasn't being talked about publicly, but the trees needed to be felled. The community continued to challenge the council and some of them chose to do this through legal means. I'm no legal expert, um, but it did become a really bad idea for the council to pursue this. Now, the council's position was that they had a contract to carry out. Anybody getting in the way of that was subject to an injunction, um, ultimately. Um, and I, I know that, that you know, the, the councils um, have a, a lot of uh, experience at, at using legal means um, to, to, uh, to deliver public services. There was one point when a judge presiding over a court case in 2018, when the council was prosecuting protesting residents, um, he stopped proceedings to double check with the council's barrister that the leader of Sheffield City Council was actually prepared to send Sheffield citizens to prison. And she was. So... This is where we had a situation where private security was involved and, you know, residents, citizens, not everybody, of course, we're talking about a smaller group, um, they were injunction breakers, they were law breakers. Okay, thank you. Um, meanwhile, some of the protesters were using their capacity, their resources, their skills to find other ways of delaying the tree felling. This included getting lots of media coverage, high profile visits from pop stars, uh, the then Environment Minister Michael Gove. Um, but the straw that <clears throat> excuse me, broke the camel's back was, um, we think um, at the moment, convincing the Forestry Commission to investigate <clears throat> excuse me, if such a large number of trees could be felled without a licence. To carry out that investigation meant that the felling had to pause. And through these delaying tactics, um, the uh, well, basically, we were able, uh, we protesters and um, the, the interested parties were able to convince national organisations to get involved in the debate a bit more directly and challenging the, the, the contractual arrangement. And this was, I, I do think, down to that collective capacity of those community members. And uh, so these are examples and, uh, of, of reports that have been written, all of them very critical of, of what happened. This started with street trees, but of course this was about something much bigger, about local democracy. And the challenging of the council led to a referendum in, in Sheffield, and we have now moved from a leader and cabinet system to a committee model. Now, we'll see how that pans out and how that works, but that's pretty significant for the city. We also find ourselves in this intriguing situation where the council contractor partnership has now been extended to include the protesters. So through mediated talks, an apology, joint statement, a number of other things kind of happening in the background, we have a street tree partnership and a new strategy. We're continuing to learn in Sheffield and very publicly at the moment. If any of you go on YouTube, oh, this is my new box set. This is fantastic. The independent street... Sorry, it sounds really morbid, doesn't it? I'm boring, I don't know. There's a, an independent Sheffield street tree inquiry happening, which has been chaired by Sir Mark Lowcock, and you can listen to, um, to the, uh, the evidence that's been submitted. But it just shows how the relationship between the City Council and its citizens changed over time, 
And it also shows the dangers of paying only lip service to consulting the public or the community when what they want and what they expect is much fuller involvement. So these examples call into question what partnership really means. I think it's not all rosy, um, but not being flexible, not engaging with real community consultation will, will bring problems for sure. And these examples, I promise you, they're not about council bashing. I, I really do understand the difficult position that the council was in and continues to be in. But, you know, we're in a, a new place now. I'm astonished, really, about how much information is being made publicly available, although council was forced to make that publicly available. But it's, it's kind of, it's, um, it marks a really completely different approach to how um, the councillors in power at the time decided to, to operate in the cabinet. Now things are, um, are tr more transparent. Um, they also outline that things change over time and that I think at the moment I think it's the longevity of a partnership um, is something to aim for, even if that is going to be really, it can be really painful along the way. So I just want to end it there really and thank you for listening. For those of you joining me later, I'm doing the, the, a session about partnerships and we'll do some thinking about our own partnerships as well. Um, and uh, everybody coming to that will get one of these, but anybody else who wants one can just come and uh, grab one from me. And um, that's it, thank you very much.